Well, good morning and uh, welcome. Uh, day 10, hard to believe, day 10 of our 21 days of prayer. And it is uh, wonderful to see you this morning. Uh, good to get in the Word together first thing. And uh, I count it a real privilege to do this. We're going to head back to uh, Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, beginning again at verse 15 and working our way down to verse 23, we started this last week, and we're going to finish it this morning. Uh, last time we, we met together, we talked about why Paul prayed. And you remember that uh, the Apostle Paul uh, was rejoicing in the gospel as he thought about the believers in Ephesus, and it caused his heart to praise God. That's what prompted him to pray. He wanted simply to rejoice in all that God was doing in the believers in Ephesus and was thankful for the evidence of the spiritual blessings of Christ uh, in them. And then second, you remember that last week we looked at from verse 15 and 16 that uh, Paul also wanted to petition God. Uh, he wasn't satisfied just that they were in Christ. He wanted to see them growing in Christ. He wanted to see them taking hold of the things that Christ had won from, for them at the cross. And uh, so that's why Paul prayed. That's what prompted him. Well, this morning we're going to talk about how Paul prayed and what he prayed. Uh, now, as you're turning to Ephesians chapter 1 in verse 15, let me ask you just a quick question. And it's this, if we were to follow you around for the week and listen in on your prayer life, what would we learn about prayer from you? Uh, what would we learn about its place in your life and family? And I don't know about you, but I find that kind of an, a, an intimidating thought to have somebody watch or listen in on what I'm praying. But the truth of the matter is we've all got a style that comes out in our prayer life. And um, I remember years ago, uh, maybe you've seen this video, The War Room. And I remember being struck by the uh, prayer rooms that the individuals in this movie had developed and uh, how much that had transformed their lives and especially their prayer lives. Uh, maybe you've got a room like this. Maybe you've got a war room for prayer somewhere in your home. Uh, maybe you've got a routine that you do follow morning by morning, uh, a guide that keeps you focused as you pray, a journal that you record the things that you're asking God to do and the answers that God is providing. Whatever the case may be, the truth of the matter is the Apostle Paul here in Ephesians chapter 1 is showing us his style of prayer. And he gives us some wonderful insights into how to pray and what to pray. So let's dig in. Well, let's think about how he prayed. Uh, first of all, I want you to notice from verse 16 that the Apostle Paul prayed with perseverance and persistence. You'll notice the phrase, he says, I have not stopped. And then verse 17, he says, I keep asking. And the emphasis here in the original is, I keep on asking. And so Paul was persistent in his prayer requests. He didn't quit. He didn't stop. He didn't give up praying for this group. Uh, I, I know that a lot of us, our praying is rather rather haphazard, unfortunately, and it can be spasmatic. And uh, sometimes prayer is simply uttered in a moment of crisis. But not so with Paul. There was a consistent pattern and a planned pattern of prayer in his life. He knew what he wanted God to achieve in the life of those that he was concerned for. And he kept asking that God would, in fact, achieve it. And in fact, Paul calls us and his readers in chapter 6 and verse 18 of, Eph of Ephesians, after he explains the nature of the warfare and the spiritual armor, that we too need to be consistent and persistent in our praying. Well, here's the question. How do we fight spiritually? We do so on our knees. And how often do we need to fight on our knees? The answer Paul gives us is constantly. We need to pray while we're at work. We need to pray while we're, we're 
at home. We need to pray in unhurried moments, and we need to pray in hurried moments. We need to pray when everything is calm in our lives, and we need to pray when there's a crisis occurring. We need to pray specifically, and we need to pray generally. We need to pray for spiritual needs, and we need to pray for physical needs. We need to do what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, and that is we are to pray with all kinds of prayers and supplication, because that is the language of a redeemed child of God. And that is the means through which the kingdom of God is realized in a broken world. Well, here's the second way in which Paul prayed. He prayed with a focus on the character and glory of God. Now you'll notice that three times Paul, as he writes to his readers, tells them that what God has done for them has been done to the praise of his glory. He says this in verse 6, in verse 12, and then again in verse 14. And he reminds them also here in verse 17 that the one that Paul is praying to is none other than the glorious Father. Paul understood that the subject and object of his prayer life had to be God and his glory. It was the starting point, the middle point, and the end goal of his prayer life. I love this comment from Eric Alexander. He says, The greatness and glory of God is the proper focus of all true prayer. What makes all the difference in how we pray is the vision you have of God in all his glory. Well, there's how Paul prayed. Persistently, constantly, with a focus on the glory of God. But also, I want you to notice the things that Paul prayed for, the things that were a great concern to his soul for those that he was praying for. First of all, in verse 17, Paul tells us that he, he is praying that they would know God better. They would know God better. In fact, he says that you might know. Now, this word know in the original means much more than just gaining an inter intellectual understanding of God. Uh, what he's asking here is for a life-changing, transforming intimacy with God, a deep spiritual understanding of God and his gifts that literally shapes how we think and how we feel and how we act. And this is a work, as Paul identifies, that only the Holy Spirit can do because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't reveal the Lord to us, well, frankly, our understanding of God remains in the dark. Well, Paul's deepest desire for himself and his readers, as you see from this text, is that they would see and know God for who he truly is. So many people have a low view of God, but Paul desired for his readers to have a high and a full view of of the living God. Paul was not praying to a weak little God, but to the glorious Father who is full of majesty and full of mercy and transcendence and power. And he wanted them to understand this in the very depths of their being. I like this quote from Carson. He says this, what is the greatest need of the church today? The one thing we need in, in, in our Western world is a deep a deeper knowledge of God. We need to know God better. And I think we can safely say, can't we, that the beginning, middle, and end of the Christian life, as Jesus defined it in John 17, is that we would know God and be in fellowship with God. Well, what's the second thing Paul prayed for? Not only that they would know God better, but second, that they would know the blessings of the gospel better. That's verse 18. And once again, we read the words that you might know. Paul longed for them to not only to know God better, but that they would know better the spiritual blessings that he's just listed in verse 3 to 14, which he boils down now into two simple requests. One, that they would know the hope of their calling. That's verse 18. The hope of their calling. You'll notice that. He says this. Listen. This is, this is wonderful. I pray also that the eyes of your heart 
may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. You know, biblical hope is, is assurance. It's a certainty. It's, it's, it's being absolutely certain that God will fulfill his word to you and will honor every promise he has made in his word. It's an unshakable certainty that the believer has in God because of, of the truth found in his word. Our hope in Christ reminds us of our call to saving faith. It reminds us that God has called us into his family as his dear child. And it reminds us of the fullness of all the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ that are ours forever and ever and ever. But this leads us to the second thing. Not only that we understand the hope of our calling, but we know the riches of his glorious inheritance. And that's found in verse 18. Paul goes on, he says, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Now you'll notice here the word riches. You know, dear child of God, you are wealthy beyond your wildest dreams. What you possess in Christ is priceless and precious because it comes from God to you. But the tense of the words here in the original language suggest that you and I, now listen, that you and I in Christ are God's riches. We are God's inheritance. We are that precious possession that God cherishes and keeps and values because his dear son is in us. And God is, ensures that nothing can separate us from himself or from Christ or from any of the spiritual blessings that are ours in Christ, Christ, which leads me to the last and final request. And that is that Paul prayed that they would know Christ, Christ's great power better. That's found in verse 19. Listen to this verse. And he says, In his incomparable great power for us who believe, that power is like the working of his mighty strength. Now this isn't just any power. This is... God's power. This is power that Paul defines as being incomparable, mighty in strength. And that power is available to you, dear child of God. It's at work within you, and it's at work all around you. God's power not only raised Jesus from the dead, but it exalted Jesus to the highest position, placing him as the absolute and supreme sovereign over heaven and earth, over all earthly and heavenly powers, and over all his enemies for your sake and for the sake of the church as a whole forever and ever. This power enables us to overcome sin. This power enables us to pursue holiness. This power enables us to witness for Jesus. This power enables us to serve him obediently. This power enables us to worship him alone. This power enables us to fight against the schemes of the enemy, to be like Christ, and to be changed into his likeness. This power enables us to, to, battle, to, to battle depression and worry and anxiety and doubt and fear due to COVID. And this power enables us to battle every dynamic force, force that sets itself up against us. And this power enables us to live for the glory of God, because this power ensures our arrival someday in the presence of God before the glory of God. No wonder Paul told his readers to seek it and to know it and to use it and to rest in it because it belonged to King Jesus, who is the head of the church and is available to God's people without measure. So let's be in prayer for one another. Constantly asking, God, that each of us might know and lean fully upon God's call to hope, God's rich inheritance in us, and God's incomparable power to the glory of God alone. Well, amen and amen. Thank you for allowing me to share these few thoughts with you about why Paul prayed and how Paul prayed and what Paul prayed. Well, this morning, we, uh, we have our verse.
for day 10, and it's this. It's a wonderful verse, Isaiah 42 and 16. Here's what it says. I will lead the blind by the ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. What a great verse. Spend time today meditating on that, thinking that through. And as you do, let's be praying, especially for our government. They are now in unfamiliar places, aren't they? They're following unfamiliar paths that they might know the, the guidance of God in all that they decide and that they might, in fact, find the living God in all that they do. As well, let's be praying especially for our young people as they're making all kinds of decisions and they're they're walking along in many ways, uh, many un, uncharted paths. And let's be praying that God would guide their hand in their decisions that they're making about education and vocation in relational decisions. And so let me pray for you right now and pray for these things. Let's, let's go into the throne of the living God. Father, thank you for the privilege we have to meet together and to open the word of life together. And uh, Father, we rejoice in all that we have in Christ, all that you're doing in our lives because of Christ. Thank you for the, the call that is in our lives to hope. Thank you, Lord, for the thought that we are not only rich in Christ, but we, we are an inheritance to the Father in Christ. And thank you for his great power that is at work within us, that resurrection power that is available to us. And Father, how true it is that we're finding ourselves on, on unfamiliar paths these days. And sometimes we find ourselves in the dark and in, in uncertainty about where we're headed. Thank you that you're the God who turns the darkness into light. You, you turn those unfamiliar paths and you smooth them out before us. And I pray, Father, that our government officials, in fact, would experience that. Lord, that all that they're facing would lead them to Christ, the one who alone is able to guide them correctly. And, uh, Father, that you would help smooth out these roughy, rough days that we're in, we pray, and that we would trust you along the path that you've chosen for us. And, Father, we pray for our young people. Indeed, help them as they're making life decisions and important decisions about uh, education, vocation, and relationships. Father, they'd place you at the center of all that they do and think, that they'd live for your glory and your glory alone. And so thank you, Father, for the joy we've had to meet together in the name of Christ. Lord, would you bless your people today. And, uh, and Father, may they know your grace in all that they do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.